Hello. This could go wrong in so many different ways, so I just want to declare I've got an asthma inhaler in my hand because I've been having an asthma flare-up. It should be fine, but I might need to run off the stage and cough, and it might be so bad that I vomit. So hopefully it's good, but stress can bring it up, and obviously, as much as I enjoy being in front of you all, it's still a little bit scary. So I've just got it, so in case you're like, what is she holding? It's not a weapon. It's <laughs> drugs, performance-enhancing drugs for my life and my, and my lungs. So really lovely to be with you all here today, minus the whole suffocation risk um, and the COVID risk, so aren't we brave? Um, I'm here to give a little chat about the book that I wrote and hopefully how it might be useful to some of you in this room who are either practicing or interested in security. So without further ado, um, who is the woman on the left? What day is today? Which organization has no more funding to carry on doing the great work of promoting women and girls in STEM? The Ada Lovelace Institute, it's fun, history is fun, so is current affairs. So yes, um, lots of, and that's gonna be part of this presentation. So she is the daughter of Lord Byron. She was waterboarded by her mother in math and science, but particularly math, in order to not be like her father, Lord Byron, because uh, her mom, after they split, decided that mathematics was the way to go, and thank goodness she did, because she ends up becoming what history decides to be one of the first computer programmers in this country as well, so that's exciting for us. Who is on the right? Socrates, indeed. A controversial choice representing the Western canon of philosophy, pale, male, and stale. And yet I was worried that if I put Confucius, we might go down a different path. Um, but I would just like to say that obviously philosophy can be so much more, and indeed occurs in every culture and country around the world. So, good for us. Um, really quickly, we don't have a lot of time, hence why the book is available outside, <laughs> sit, signed copies and on audiobook. Um, and I'm also happy to answer any questions or chat afterwards as well. We're gonna do really quickly, what is technology ethics, how it might be useful for you. We're gonna have a very exciting debate, including the views of two of the people who've been speaking today. And then we're gonna end on a provocative and exciting note at the bottom about how to start solving this problem. So very quickly, um, the lovely book cover so that you recognize it when you go to the table. Um, I am here with a picture of a BBC microphone, not because I work for them, because I don't. Uh, I often <coughs> freelance to them. And if you are on the World Service, listening to the World Service between one to two in the morning because you are up coding, as I know at least one person in this room is because he will sometimes text me while I'm on air, uh, usually to say that's wrong. Um, <laughs> I will uh, often be doing politics, economics, and tech commentary. So it's trying to keep it real for the global listeners. Uh, great face for radio. The flags on the bottom explain the unusual accent. I was born and raised in the United States. I've lived in France, and France is a huge part of my work and remains so to this day, but I have lived in this country since 1998, so vowels will fluctuate. Swearing is definitely British now, though. Um, educated on both sides of the Atlantic. I like to feel the special relationship is embodied here. I do drink tea, but I prefer coffee. Nerd credentials there. I have walked the walk. I sympathize with all of you. I wrote this book to try to help you. I wished that this book had existed when I too started out in technology back in the Jurassic age uh, because I am so old. So this was the problem statement that I had on my wall when I started writing. Uh, writing, of course, because I was frustrated, which is I hope where so many of you might relate when you have to innovate because the thing that you wish existed in the world does not. I wanted, because I felt it didn't exist, and I felt my friends and colleagues also felt it didn't exist, a way of thinking about technology, what I was building, what I was using, what I was investing in. I wanted to come up with a way to create and use it, because I'm not just building it, I'm also a consumer and a citizen, um, in a way that you know, maximizes benefits and minimizes harms, easy. And so this was my visual. These visuals are very important to my work. So that's, that's how I feel every time I sit down to write or indeed think. But what to do? How can we have a technology ethics chat in an Anglo-Saxon country where we don't study philosophy, most of us? It's not part of our curriculum. Who in this room has studied in France or in the French system? I'm outing you now. How many hours a week did you have to study philosophy in high school? Six. Six? Did you have to take a philosophy examination to go to university, regardless of your degree subject? Do you see, like, 
we're bringing, we're bringing a knife to a gunfight against the French. Like they're going to mop the floor today. Um, <laughs> and it's important because if you don't have the tools to think, how can you even have some of these conversations? Um, philosophy, for those of us who haven't studied it, um, who don't have the, the joy of being French educated, we'll, we have one slide to catch up fast. So it's, luckily it's easy, right? It's fine. So it's a couple thousand years of some of the most important thinking humans have ever done. I built it out to feel like a Swiss army knife because I like something tangible, but other people have called it, I think it was Julian Bagini, the software of the mind that you can download. Um, six branches, main branches. This could be a way more complicated slide. I do not wish to offend anyone who's actually studied philosophy. It's the simplest I could do. This is minimum viable philosophy, okay? <laughs> philosophy, <laughs> ethics is one of the six branches, super and it breaks down into these four strands here. What does right even mean? What do people think is right? How should people act? How do we put it into action? <coughs> it sounds super abstract, but I was actually interviewing for a major technology company who has an operational ethics team, which I really would love to see what they're gonna do. It's very exciting. People are doing this stuff. And so you would parse technology, which of course is somewhere off this slide, through any of these lenses that you might wish to look. So if you're ever sort of stuck or you're in a jam, you're in an interview, or you just need to make a decision. This is a great way to do your own due diligence intellectually. But what to do? This is our obligatory French um, philosopher slide. Put on your turtleneck, light your cigarette. The ship, the shipwreck, the plane, the plane crash, electricity, electrocution, you invent technology, you're inventing progress, but you're also inventing negativity, which of course makes us wonder, well, where does neutrality come into play? I have to go really fast, I'm so sorry, but there's a scary clock next to me. So there's a debate. We're gonna go into people far more interesting than me in a minute anyway. So team one, uh, team technology is neutral. I used to be on this team. I wrote the book and changed my mind, but Gary Kasparov was one of my, my sort of acolytes in this. He thinks that tech, is agnostic, okay? So it's like the universal blood type, it works for everybody. It's a view, a lot of people have that view. It's an interesting view. Ethical AI is like ethical electricity. Werner Werner Vogels, chief technology officer at Amazon. I cited him in my book because he talks about Amazon's facial recognition technology, which is a topic I spend a lot of time thinking about. And he just thinks it's not Amazon's call to think if it's tools or technologies, whatever it's putting out in the market is ethical or responsible. Whose call is it? Societies. So it's our problem to, to sort out. Um, and I like this, it's, about, it's a valid point. Sometimes steel is used to make incubators for babies, sometimes it's used to make guns. So far so clear. Professor Daniela Rus, uh, she's got a really lovely quote here. She's kind of got the same thing, but she takes it further, which is why I really like it. She's like AI, robotics, machine learning, et cetera, these are just tools. She takes it further, by the people, for the people, which for Americans in this room, that phraseology is not accidental, not neutral. And I think it's the way to take this argument out, about which, now. <laughs> Who thinks that technology is not neutral? Let's find out. We heard him this morning. Sir Tim Berners-Lee invites us to think about how we're designing a system and nothing is self-evident. You can't take anything for granted. We just heard from Dr. Ian Levy. It's all about the values we're putting into our systems and our products. It's the choices that we're making at each stage from idea all the way through to execution and market release. Caroline Criado Perez, I'm sure that everyone in this room, particularly the men, have read her prize winning book, Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men, which of course won the Financial Times Business Book of the Year and the Royal Society Prize, and thus would be required reading for any good technologist. And she talks about some really interesting innovations and really helps us to understand how the way that we have bias in our design can go from the annoying to the life-threatening. She talks about things like phones being designed for the default hand, which of course is a man's hand, which of course on average is bigger than a woman's hand. That's annoying. Life-threatening would be the voice recognition software that's trained on men's voices more than women's, which means that when women are trying to use their voice assistant in cars to get directions, it doesn't work, but it might work for the man sitting in the car next to them, super annoying. But really annoying if you're a female attending physician in an emergency room and you're trying to use voice assistant software and it doesn't work. And of course, the answer to one of the people who makes that software was that women needed to train their voices to be lower 
so that we sound like men, which I think is the wrong answer. I can't believe I even have to say this, but we do, so here we are. So, Professor Sheila Jasanoff, whose beautiful book, The Ethics of Invention, I really recommend reading if you haven't already. She helps us to think about impact, that the same technologies that we're building, they're neutral by the people, for the people, in fact, have a very different impact depending on where they are released into the world. Because of course, humans are very varied, and the societies that we build and create and maintain and the power structures we're upholding differ. The same tools and technologies from Kansas to Kabul have a really different impact. So a lovely book, and I hope that's a bit of a tour, just very, very quickly, far more in depth in chapter one of another book that's available outside. <laughs> we want to get to solutions though, and I wanna make sure we spend time on this, which is why I sort of whipped through that debate. And my goal, by the way, isn't to get you to agree with me, that would be incredibly boring, and I'd much rather we have a, an interesting chat where you can tell me what you're thinking about. Um, when you're locked in a room for two years during a pandemic, you're desperate for moments like this. So I'm happy to see you all, hear what you think. I wanted us though to just think about it, but just raise the awareness. Do you think it's neutral or not? Do you think the work you're doing is neutral or not? Or what we're putting out into the world is neutral or not? But then there's the so what, and then there's the now what. Like you're gonna come up with your own answer and then the question is what are you gonna do about it? And one of the things I was thinking about, which is relevant to it being Ada Lovelace Day, of course, is that we have massive differences in our by the people, for the people statement. And we know this, our sector is not particularly good at talent spotting, talent cultivation, and talent retention. And we could call that political correctness or wokery or whatever, or we could call it a national security risk, which is what GCHQ calls it. So don't take my word for it. Uh, that's what this, this country's government thinks. Um, and it's worrying. It's also what Tim Cook thinks. And a lot of people blasted Tim Cook when he gave this interview to the um, BBC technology editor, Zoe Kleinman, a couple of weeks ago and said that there's no good excuse for the absence of women in tech. And loads of people put up pictures of his company's board, as you would expect. You know what it looks like. I don't have to show you that slide. We know, right? And we also know the stats in his company, which is it's about 35% women and most of them aren't in technical roles, which also, has not changed in my entire career, and I'm 46. So it's getting really boring having that conversation, and I'm actually sure it's boring for everyone else too. And it's not fun for the younger people coming up who are like, you've got all these diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, you spend tons of money on it, and we're not moving the needle, what's going on? <coughs> and I mention it today because it's Ada Lovelace Day, because the Ada Lovelace Day festival that happens all over the world has just said it's not gonna continue anymore because they've lost funding. And I would just like to remember, and if anyone knows Mr. Cook, Apple is a $3 trillion company. It would really not take a lot for companies to get together and put their money where their mouth is and keep things like that going because it gets into schools and it gets into the places where tech companies are not yet going to find the next generation of talent. And we just saw a very powerful presentation from Dr. Levy about the threats we're facing. We're gonna need all hands on deck, all brains on deck. It doesn't matter what they look like, but it also does matter what they look like, sound like, and think like. We're gonna need that diversity. So we need to move those numbers and we're gonna need to get into schools and we have to fundamentally change, not just, I think, the number of people that are taking computer science and programming, which is such a narrow view of technology, of course, but introduce the liberal arts and humanities back in as well. Time for some critical thinking again, so we don't tell people to change their voices when our software doesn't work. So, somebody is putting their money where their mouth is, so I wanted to end on a high. Um, our friends at GCHQ, of which the National Cyber Security <laughs> Center is affiliated, are doing a lot to not just talent spot, but seed it, grow it, cultivate it, arguably more than companies. They're not just sending people in for a day to give a presentation and then off they go. They are funding a 14 week nano degree in data and software for women who are looking to do career pivots. I, I had a look at their curriculum. It's hardcore, it's not a couch to 5K. I think you'd actually have to do a little bit of training before you even get onto this course, but it's worth about 10,000 pounds, this training, and you get a job at the end of it, either at GCHQ or at one of the private sector companies that has signed up to sponsor a slot. So if your company is interested in that and wants to get part of it, be part of the change, be the change you wanna see in the world, maybe check it out. 
because uh, we haven't got the right mix of minds to get across our threats. That's your national security quote. They're also working with Code First Girls, which is, again, doing as much as they can to offer free coding, something that many of the people in this room, I'm sure, are doing and could do much more of. Um, and again, not just reaching out to girls, but all sorts of different talent pools. And they've already taught over 2,000 girls. And I like these sort of, you know, these backgrounds. They're going to people with a non-computer science background. Lots of people will self-select out because they've kind of been taught like, oh, you're either kind of on the bus or off the bus when it comes to tech. You've either been doing it since you were 14, coding in your parents' basement or garage or whatever, wearing a hoodie or not. You either have like dyed your hair hot pink or something very interesting or no. And you're kind of, you just kind of feel like maybe you can't get into it. Not true. We want to really open the door. We need to kind of blast the doors off, in fact, and show people there's a place for them. I like this picture of this desk. Does anyone know whose desk it is? Where is it? Yeah, it's Alan Turing's desk at Bletchley, which again, if you haven't been and you want to go get inspired, in case you're feeling a bit down after this chat, get on the train, go. It's so good. Also, a ticket's valid for a whole year. <coughs> great, great um, value for money. Um, Look what they are doing. They're funding university degrees. We're in a cost of living crisis. I don't know how many of you are talking with young people, but the ones that I'm talking to are like feeling pretty grim right now. We've really messed up the world for them. So getting into student debt to go and do a degree is really scary for a lot of them. So I like to come and give talks to them and say, I have found someone who will pay for you to go to school. I'll, pay, I'll find someone who'll pay for you to get your university qualification. You're gonna come out with great skills. You're gonna get paid summer internships and you're gonna get a job at the end of it. And if you don't wanna go and serve big tech and do like surveillance stuff for money <laughs> in the Google way, maybe you wanna do surveillance stuff on people who are trying to take everybody's data in this country and shut our companies down. Maybe you wanna serve your country for a bit and then go into the private sector. I'm not saying to do it. I'm, I'm not affiliated with any of these organizations. I'm an independent researcher, but I do know what it's like to have to work to pay my way through school. And I do know what it's like to graduate during some pretty grim recessions. This is exciting. I'd love to see the private sector backing this a lot more and doing, putting their own money into it to send people to school as well. We're gonna have to overhaul how we think about education and how we think about education specifically for our sector if we want to improve it. The goal is 50% <coughs> representation on this course Okay, like that's a big ask. We're gonna to have to be part of building that bridge. Um, this is, if you were to take one picture and circulate it among your people on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on TikTok, for those of you who are young, how I envy you. Um, <laughs> this is the one, this is the one that kids need to see, that young people need to see, that parents and teachers need to see. It's the one that I hope that companies that have deep pockets will say, rather than just talking a good talk when they pop over for a visit, get out your checkbook. There's people doing this work. If you don't wanna do it on your own, just fund it with them and partner. And this is, this is again what the young people are gonna to need to see to come into our space. We have to make it more welcoming to them in every way that we can. So, that's it. We're a tiny bit over. Happy to do questions and answers either here or afterwards. Thanks so much for your time.